guys, it's Christina from Blossom and Root. Today I'm going to share with you all of our curriculum choices for my homeschooled kindergartner for the year 2019-2020. So we've actually kind of cheated and started kindergarten already, even though it's only April, because my daughter was ready and she's really been accelerating quite quickly this spring. So I thought, you know what, Why we don't have to wait till August, we are homeschoolers, we can do whatever we want. So I went ahead and got everything organized and we started about three weeks ago. Right now we're taking about two weeks per, uh, for each one week in the curriculum because we're just on a really relaxed schedule going into the spring and summer right now. So we're not in any hurry. So I'm really excited to show you all the choices that I have made for her year ahead. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me Christina at blossomandroot.com and I will also post links to everything in a blog post which will be linked in the video description below. So let's get started. I'm going to start with language arts and reading. So we'll be using Blossom and Root Kindergarten for our language arts and reading and I'm going to open it up so you can kind of see what a typical week looks like. So in the parent guide, which is what this is, you'll see that it tells you what you're going to be doing for your read aloud. She also does a narration for our read aloud selections each week. Right now, um, I'm just filming her telling me the story. She likes to be on camera, so she talks a lot more when she's on camera. So I just pull out my phone and she tells me the story um, that I've read to her that week. And then we always have copy work. At the beginning, it's just practicing a letter. But towards the end of the curriculum, we start working on sentences and, and words. Um, towards the very end of the curriculum. So it's just a very gentle copy work introduction. It's very simple. It doesn't take very long at all. Um, we always have a journaling prompt. And again, I usually just ask her the question and she kind of tells me her thoughts and then she illustrates it sometimes, sometimes she doesn't. And then we have reading lessons. So I usually break our reading lessons up over two different lessons, sometimes three. And at the beginning, it's really simple stuff, just reviewing letter sounds. We start playing with um, simple CBC word families about week six-ish, week four, week six, and then progress throughout. We do do some sight words towards the end of the curriculum in the Charlotte Mason style. So that is what a typical week looks like. And in the parent guide, I just wanted to show you, just open up to a random week. It's just laid out really clearly each week for you to look at. So I can see, oh, it's week 11. We're going to read chapters 9 and 10 from My Father's Dragon. We're going to practice writing the letter G. Um, we've got a journal prompt. Um, my daughter will tell me the story that we read that week, from the chapters that we read that week from My Father's Dragon. And then for reading, we're going to talk about the G sound, um, use it at the beginning of, and end of different words, and play with building og words like hog and bog. And then the second lesson, we'll build words using MTS. A-I-F-D-R-O-G, which are all the words that we would have reviewed up to this point. So it's just playing with different words, nonsense words and real words. So that is what the parent guide looks like. Let me show you what the student notebook looks like. I had so many requests when we first launched our kindergarten to split the notebook into two PDFs because a lot of children who are younger were having a hard time writing in a notebook that was this thick when it was just one. So I did, and I actually took their advice and split it for myself too. If you buy our curriculum and you want it all in one notebook, that's totally fine. You can just have it printed out that way. You don't have to do it this way. However, I do recommend that you print it, this particular notebook, single-sided, not double-sided, because as you can see, there are some things to cut out towards the end of the curriculum. So that's my recommendation. All of the other notebooks, besides our language notebooks, our language arts notebooks, can be done single-sided if you prefer, but I always recommend double-sided on any of our language arts notebooks, no matter what grade level. So we've already started, so I'll show you the first week of the curriculum in the notebook. So first we do our copy work, and we keep it really simple. So we keep it very short and sweet in Blossom and Root Kindergarten. My daughter will trace the letter a couple of times. She also likes to do this with marker and then she will make her very best letter once and in the case of the little a she did it twice because she didn't like her first one. So it's just one time. Very very short and sweet. And then we talk about other things that start with A 
and she draws pictures and I label them for her. And then um, this is a journal prompt. So for this particular activity, we read the story of the crow and the pitcher, um, which is an Aesop fable. And she did an experiment where she got to do what the crow does in the story. And then she just was supposed to illustrate what happened. So she did, except she went off on a tangent and made it about something completely different, which was fine. <laughs> um, so I wrote down what she wanted me to write, which was once upon a time, a little bird was making this girl warm because it was a cold and rainy day, which has nothing to do with the story, but that is okay. And actually that happens a lot with my first grader too. When she does her narrations for Blossom and Root, she will often start out telling me the story I read to her, but then add all these other events and tangents. And it ends up being this fantastic story that wasn't the one I read, but that's totally fine with me. So until about the second or third grade level, I will be helping them with their dictation. So they'll tell me what they want me to write and I'll write it down for them because I want the emphasis to be on creativity and thought and processing the story, not on handwriting, grammar, you know, worrying about spelling or anything else. Because think how much this would be limited if I had my daughter writing it. She doesn't know how to write anything yet, so what would she be, she would be so frustrated. We skipped the narration that week because it was our first week. So I will go to her narration for this one. So this is for the lion and the mouse. She drew her favorite part of the story and then she told me what happened in the story and I wrote her words down. So that's it. It's really so, uh, short and sweet and simple. Towards the second part of the year, we start doing more, a little bit more. Um, during that, let me see if I can find it. Yeah, so for this example, we have the sentence, I am going to the moon from Little Bear. And I would cut out all of these word cards for her. Um, you collect them over time, so they're not always on each week. And she would figure out how to form the sentence, I am going to the moon. So it goes into detail about that in the parent guide, but I just wanted you to see that it does get a little bit more difficult towards the end of the year, but it's still very, very gentle in this kindergarten year. All right, the next thing I want to do is walk you through the different books that we use with Blossom and Root Kindergarten's Language Arts program. So we begin with Aesop's Fables, and you can use any version that you would like. Um, I think you can actually find all of these online for free, just to read online. But I wanted to have a real book, and I wanted one with illustrations. So I have actually bought, I think this is our fourth collection of Aesop's Fables, because I just didn't like any of the other ones very much. Um, but this one is great, because they kind of expand on the stories a little bit. And the pictures are so pretty. Oh, look at that, that's gorgeous. So um, during our Aesop's Fables unit, we read two per week. And as, as I said, we actually are breaking our each week up into two weeks anyway, so we just read one of them a week. But as you can see, this version is especially beautiful. And the stories are just a little bit longer than the original tales, which is nice because those are just really, really short. And I like to expand on them a little bit. So that is the book that we're using for our Aesop's Fables. And then, these aren't necessarily in order that we do them in kindergarten, I just pulled them to show you guys. But we do My Father's Dragon. I didn't know about this book until I went to write our, our kindergarten curriculum. I had never heard of it before and it is wonderful. It is such a sweet story. It's actually part of a trilogy and we have read all three of them now because of finding this for the kindergarten curriculum. But it's about this little boy who goes on an adventure to free a dragon from slavery. And it's just a fantastic story with so many good messages in it. So we read this book throughout several weeks. I can't remember how many weeks we take to read it, but I think we read two chapters per day, or per week. And then we have Winnie the Pooh, a classic. Um, we love this book so much. Um, I think I picked this copy up at a used bookstore. Um, but it's just, you guys are all familiar with Winnie the Pooh. So I won't go into a great amount of detail here, but we also split this up. We either do one or two of the stories per week, I can't remember, but, um, we take our time. We've got The Bears on Hemlock Mountain, which is a story we read toward the end of the year. This is another great one that I didn't know about until I was looking for books for our kindergarten level. And it's just wonderful. It's uh, about a little boy um, and his family living on this snowy, wintry mountainside. So it's a great story. It's a very short read, but we split it up over several weeks anyway. 
And then of course, the Velveteen Rabbit. Um, this is a favorite of mine from my own childhood, as I'm sure many of you can relate. Uh, I got this one from Thrift Books. And I know they have a lot of illustrated versions. This one has some pictures. But this is the version that I had when I was little, so I wanted the same version uh, for my daughters. And that one, again, we split up over several weeks. We have Little Bear. And some of these are read-alouds, and they are part of the reading curriculum. So Little Bear is one of those. We practice sentences and words from Little Bear toward the end of the year. And you guys are probably familiar with Little Bear, but... It's just such a sweet story. We have got Amelia Bedelia, which is one of the ones we also use for both a read aloud and a reading lesson. And these are really easy to find used too, and at the library. I think every single one of these would be very easy to find used or at your local library. We have Bread and Jam for Francis, which is one of my favorites from when I was little, and it's one of my daughter's favorites. We actually have this in um, Early Years Volume 2 and Kindergarten. <laughs> that was at the request of my oldest daughter because she wanted a familiar friend when she started kindergarten. That's what she said. So it's just a really sweet story. All of the Francis stories are very sweet. We have the Frog and Toad books. I think the two that we use this year are Frog and Toad All Year and Frog and Toad Are Friends. We own the other one, but I don't think it's part of the kindergarten curriculum, which is why it's not in here. So you guys are probably familiar with these two, but just really sweet stories. Um, and I think I'm gonna make some frog and toad peg dolls because my daughter really likes to do her narration um, with peg dolls. So even though that's not something I implemented in our curriculum until first grade, I think she would really enjoy doing that, especially with the frog and toad books. So I'm gonna surprise her, I think, with a little chest with frog and toad peg dolls and um, some storytelling props for that, for that unit. The next book is Danny and the Dinosaur, and this is another one that we do as a read aloud and we use for our reading lessons. Another classic. <laughs> Most of these are ones you guys probably read when you were little too. We have Stone Soup, and you can use any version of this story you like. There are lots of different versions. I am partial to this one because this is the one I had when I was a little kid. I actually had this one with a cassette tape that would read it to you. <laughs> and I still remember it because I listened to it, I think, until it broke. It was like my favorite story. But you can do so many fun things the week that you do Stone Soup. And that's the thing about Blossom and Root. Like, if you're inspired to add um, some activities or um, something that really goes with the story well, we welcome it. We say, go for it, go for it. Add whatever you want. Go down any rabbit trail you want. And so this particular story has a lot of great rabbit trails. You could definitely make stone soup in your home. Um, this would be a really fun one to do as a puppet show or a group activity where you would invite some friends over to help you make the soup. So that's stone soup. I'm so excited for that unit. <laughs> we have Horton Here's a Who, which is a Dr. Seuss book. And I really love the message in this particular book. Uh, I think it's just really important to talk about looking out for others and um, helping to protect the other people around us. So Horton Here's a Who obviously really delves into that particular subject a lot. All right, let's talk about math. So when my oldest was doing kindergarten, I used Singapore math. And we used the Kindergarten Essentials series um, during that time. And it was really pretty easy for my oldest daughter. It's a very gentle introduction to math with the Singapore style. Um, the second guide, which I think they call just B, was a bit harder. Um, so we kind of we sped through the first one um, probably in about seven weeks, I would say, and then spent the whole rest of the year on the second one. And my oldest has been using Singapore, Singapore for ever since then. Um, but I discovered wild math last year when she was in first grade, and we used the first grade level of wild math to supplement Singapore. And I loved it so much. I thought it was such a better fit for our homeschool. It really suited our learning style and our teaching style and our homeschooling style so much better. Um, Singapore is a fantastic program, and I'll kind of go into detail in my second grade curriculum reveal video for you about what we're using it for and how we're using it this year. But for my kindergartner, 
I'm not going to use the Singapore kindergarten level at all. Um, I will introduce a little bit of it in the first grade year, but for this year, we're just going to stick with wild math for my kindergartner. So wild math will be our whole math program for the kindergarten year. I feel like in this particular year, this is plenty. Um, and I also have a math program that I'll talk to you about in a minute that's part of our science program with the kindergarten curriculum for Blossom and Root. But um, between the two of those, we're covered. And I just feel like this is a really good fit for our homeschool. So this is the wild math cur uh, curriculum for the kindergarten level. And I just will show you the table of contents so you can kind of see. We study um, counting and cardinality, place value, patterns, beginning addition and subtraction up to five plus five, um, some word problems, using addition and subtraction, um, taking any two numbers, um, two through ten, and breaking it into, or taking any number from two through ten and breaking it into two different parts, and making ten in different ways. Uh, we have measurement and data and geometry. And then she recommends, and we had already been using lots and lots of math games. We love game schooling. So as you can see, this is just a really great fit for us. And these activities are done outside for the most part. Sometimes we do them in, inside too if we have really bad weather, but um, they're meant to be done outdoors. And I'll show you an example. Let's just open it up to here. So moving around items in a group that or moving items around in a group does not change the amount in the group. So that's one of the concepts. And she recommends using rock shells or something similar to show and count a group of something. And then you just rearrange the group to look differently. Um, so like lines or little clusters. And you ask them how many there are now. Then they just kind of, they, they come to understand that just because you move the objects around doesn't change the amount that there were to begin with. So as you can see, that's kind of the layout. She goes through a concept and then different activities that you can use to learn that concept. And um, sometimes when I was doing it with my first grader, there were certain activities that she really loved. So we did them over and over and over again and I just made them more difficult each time we did them. And there were some activities that we skipped just because we didn't have some of the things on hand that they required or we adapted them for things we did have. So it's just a really flexible curriculum. Um, for the kindergarten level, I'll probably just pick uh, an activity or two each time we have an outing for us to do. Uh, nothing formal about that at all. Just pick where we're, oh, today I wanna work on patterns, so we'll do these two activities on our hike today. That's how simple we keep it. So that's the math curriculum we're gonna use. And now I'll show you the Blossom and Root curriculum. Um, so I'll be talking about math and science together because math and science are integrated in the kindergarten curriculum. So I'm gonna go ahead and skip ahead to this. So I can kind of show you, because it's a, a pretty different curriculum. Um, what you're going to be doing is, throughout the whole year, you're going on a space adventure. And instead of saying, okay, well, day one, you're going to talk about this, and day two, you're going to talk about that, we do it in the form of letters from ground control. So the letters are written to your child, who is the captain. And each week, ground control gives them another assignment to do. And it's through this whole story of your child visiting someone named Zula, who has written to them from another planet outside of our solar system. And Zula is doing a school project at her school and wants to know all about Earth and life on Earth and our specific solar system. So during your child's preparation and journey to go see Zula, they are preparing stuff to help her with her school project. And so we cover things like uh, the requirements for life, what living things need, um, what you'll need to take care of your body over a long trip, things like good nutrition and adequate sleep and exercise and things like that. And of course, the bulk of the year is spent learning all about our solar system. So it's a really flexible science curriculum. You can use whatever resources you have on hand as you're learning about each thing. For example, the week that you learn about the planet Saturn, you can get books about Saturn from the library, you can watch documentaries about Saturn or YouTube videos about Saturn, or you can use whatever resource you want to explore that. You can visit the planetarium, anything you like. So it's very open-ended. You can spend as much or as little time on each prompt as you want. It's only one prompt per week, so you can do everything in one day. You can do it over two days, which is what we do, or you can do it um, just one day a week. So 
that's what that looks like. And it's a really, really fun science curriculum. And it also integrates math, which was my point. Um, so for example, one week, they tell you the, the specifications that you need to um, build your spaceship with. And your child builds a spaceship over a couple of weeks using a big cardboard box. But they say, okay, Captain, you need to install um, a toolbar that has a pattern that involves three different objects. So you can go to the store and get, you know, those little um, foam shaped stickers and have your child make a pattern along the side of their box for the toolbar, like triangle, square, heart, triangle, square, heart, for example. And you practice counting down a lot when you blast off. And there's just math integrated all the way throughout. For example, they'll say, hey, Captain Ground Control wants to know how much water you have left. You left with 20 barrels and there are nine barrels left. So how many did you already drink? Things like that. So it's just very, very loose, playful, fun, simple. Um, it's not a rigorous math curriculum. So if you want to add a rigorous math curriculum to it, you definitely can. Um, we didn't want to add a rigorous one, but we wanted to add some more structured math. So that's why we have the wild math to go with it. So that is what we're doing for math and science. And I wanna show you also the captain's log that comes with it. So this is the captain's log and it's kind of like a science journal for your child to use during the year. And if you do purchase our curriculum, you'll notice this is a big file. You do not have to print out this whole thing. As you can see, they're all the same page. So if you only want them to do the captain's log once a week, just print out 36 of them. If you want them to do it twice a week, you would do twice that much and so on. I went ahead and printed the whole thing out because I like to do these a lot, um, not just on the days that we do science, because it helps her with her calendar concepts and counting. So um, what they do is, here, I'll open it to one she's already done. Okay, so she colors the star that corresponds with the day of the week. It was a Monday. And then they color the, the date that corresponds. So it was the 15th. And then they color the dot that corresponds with the month. So you can do your calendar this way every day of the year if you want to. And then she did the, the science prompt, which was um, what she wanted to bring on the trip with her. So she told me everything that she wanted to bring and I wrote it down for her. And then she wanted to make a picture of Zula. So she did. And then she kind of got carried away and wanted to make a picture of her favorite musician on the back. So it's a really loose tool. You can, you can definitely use it just as a journal if you want to. I know a lot of our families, they like to use it as a daily journal. So it doesn't necessarily have to just be used with our science curriculum, but that's what it was designed for. So that goes with the science curriculum. Okay, so that was math and science. Let's talk about nature study next. So the nature study parent guide, um, oh, we're using Blossom and Root Kindergarten for nature study. And the nature study parent guide is in the same book as the science curriculum. So they share a book. But I will show you what a typical week looks like. So, all right, so this shows you what you're going to be reading for nature lore, and I'll explain what BABC means in a minute. Um, and nature lore is just the story that you're going to be reading to inspire your nature study lesson that week. Then it tells you what the nature study lesson will be, um, what they'll write in their nature notebook, which I'll show you in a minute, and then, of course, the prompt that goes with the science program that I had already showed you. So let's take a quick look at an example. All right, so this is from week five, and it says, for nature lore, you're going to read the squirrels of the trees from BABC, and that stands for the Burgess Animal Book for Children. So that's what that means, and I will go into detail about the two books that we use for nature study in just a minute. So the prompt for this particular week is a tree observation, and we do those uh, throughout the year because I want your child to be able to see the difference uh, in how a tree changes throughout the year. And you can do this depend no matter where you live. Um, I actually wrote this curriculum when we lived in Hawaii. And I thought at first, well, we're not gonna see very many changes, but we actually did. The trees did have their own little life cycle phases throughout the year. So that was really helpful to make us pay attention to that. And um, I'll just show you another example. So on the week six prompt, we have looking for ground dwellers to go with the striped chipmunk and his cousins story. And it says, this week we will observe for ground dwellers in our outdoor classroom, which is any outdoor area you use for nature study. While you explore your classroom, ask your child why an animal like 
might like to live underground. Remind them of the stories you have read so far in Nature Lore. Why do some of the forest animals in the story live underground? What are their homes like? How does living underground protect them from predators? Look around your outdoor classroom. Do you see any signs of ground dwellers? Holes in the ground or against the base of trees, holes or tunnels in mounded up soil? See if you can find any ground dweller homes. Once you return home, you can also look up more information about ground dwellers in your area using a field guide or the internet. And then for their nature notebook, which I'll show you in a minute, they design an underground home. So that's what a typical week of nature study looks like. Um, let me show you what the notebook looks like. Here is the nature notebook. And I'll show you the week that corresponds with the prompt we just read. So it's, they're usually mostly just space for your child to color or draw. Um, this one is for the underground home I just read to you. So they would design like a tunnel that goes down and then their underground home. That's it. It's really simple. Now some weeks you have, let's look at the tree observation one. So you have these, for any week that's a tree observation week, you have the same tree log page. And um, you ask your child what they see, what they hear, what they smell, what they feel. Again, I recommend writing their words for them at this level so that they're not hindered by what they know how to write yet and their comfort zone. So they'll be more focused on the actual assignment. And then they can draw a picture of their tree. Or if your child doesn't like to draw in color, you can always just take a picture of the tree, like a photograph, and paste it in here. And then um, same thing with a leaf or a needle. You can either draw it or paste it. It's kind of small for a real leaf, but you can do it if you want to. Or take a picture of it, of course. So that's what that would look like. And then we do have a lot of weeks where they pick an animal. So um, the Burgess Animal Book for Children covers multiple animals in each chapter. When we do weeks where we're studying different animals, your child chooses one. In this particular week, they've got a choice between squirrel, chipmunk, and chuck, woodchuck. And they choose an animal, they color in the dot that goes with it, and then they can either draw a picture of the animal or find one on the internet to print out and paste. And then you make notes about what you guys learn about that animal together. So you'll read to them about the animal using a nature guide or the internet, and then whatever you learned, ask your child to tell you what they want you to write down, and then you just write down what they want to remember. So you're kind of just helping them with the recording part. So that's what the Nature Notebook looks like. It's, again, mostly just space for them to record what they see and observe. In the second part of the year, instead of a tree log, you do a bean log. So you're growing beans and, and seeing how they grow. So let's look at the two books that we use for nature study. We've got the Burgess Animal Book for Children um, by Thornton Burgess. And if you're familiar with him, he just writes, he wrote tons of gorgeous living books about nature and animals and birds for children. So these are just stories. They're a bit longer um, than, say, the Among the People series. Or they read a bit longer. To me, they do. Um, so we usually break them up over multiple readings. And I give my daughter Play-Doh and stuff to play with while we read it because she's kind of squiggly. So um, that's what it looks like. You can get all of these online for free at the Baldwin Project, but I don't like to read off a screen. So I just ordered this particular book off Amazon. But there's a, a lot of different versions of it. And then the other book we use is Seed Babies. And this is another wonderful living book. It doesn't just talk about plant seeds, it talks about eggs too. And um, different animals that lay eggs and how an egg and a seed are similar. Um, let's see if I can show you. So it talks about bumblebees, um, frogs, the life cycle of a frog is in here, and other kinds of eggs. And again, we'll probably end up splitting these readings up over multiple sessions because they're a little longer for my younger one. And I like to give her things to do with her hands while I read. But they just also inspire the nature study prompts in the curriculum. So those are the two books we use for nature study in kindergarten. Okay, the next thing I want to share with you guys is our plan for fine arts and then also history and geography. Uh, those are all three in the same parent guide. Again, we're using Blossom and Root Kindergarten for all three of those topics. And I'll start with fine arts. So I'll show you another example of a week, a typical week. 
So this has both subjects um, in the beginning of the parent guide laid out for you. So you can see what you do for picture study is Picasso, the old guitarist. Uh, the composer you're listening to is Tchaikovsky. And um, with our kindergarten curriculum, this is kind of a more classic approach to picture study and composer study. You'll study one artist's works for nine weeks at a time and one composer's works for nine weeks at a time. And then there's always a corresponding art project that goes with the picture study. So the week that we do the old guitarist, there'll be free painting with shades of blue. If you're familiar with that picture or that painting, um, it's almost all in blues. And then for history and geography, you'll be doing the history of your family, the world events that happened when your mom was born. So I'll show you what that means when I show you the student notebook a little bit more. But I just wanted to show you a typical week of art. So in week one, you're going to study Impression Sunrise by Monet, because Monet is the artist you study for the first nine weeks. And after you've done the picture study, and the parent guide does tell you how to do that in detail, but once you've completed the picture study, you're going to do this art project that's laid out. So in this particular week, you do um, a warm color sunset and a cool sunner. Some, gosh, I can't talk. And a cool color sunset. Um, and each week, there's just similar. Like we do dabbing, dab painting in one. Let's see what we do on week 24. So week 24 is Knife and Fruit in Front of Window by Diego Rivera. And then you're going to paint a view from a window with the foreground included. So if I were to paint my window right now, I would paint the seedlings that are sitting in the windowsill and then the view outside beyond it. So you have the detailed um, list of what you'll need, detailed instructions to read to your child. And these are really simple. I don't like, I don't like things that make me go out and do a lot of shopping because <laughs> I hate shopping so much except books. So I try to make it really easy for you to just grab what you need and it's stuff you have around your house already. If you don't, it's just basic art supplies that you'll pick up at the beginning of the year and use throughout the year. So that is the um, fine arts curriculum. Now let's talk about the history curriculum. So for history and geography, you're going to be studying two different things. One thing is that you're gonna um, do a bit of a history geography unit that centers around your child. So it starts with your child and their birth and what happened and how they got their name and what was going on in the world when they were born and then it moves outward so then it goes to the parents of the child and then the grandparents of the child and then you move into your neighborhood your city your state or your district um, the country you live in and then the world so we also include um, time for you to study various local heroes and world heroes and I left that open on purpose. I do give suggestions for which heroes to maybe learn about, but that is a really personal decision for each family to make based on the values that they emphasize in their own homeschool. So I haven't decided who we're gonna study with my youngest, but um, it just tells you what to focus on each week. And the, the student notebook will show you a little bit more of what that looks like. And then you also are going to study the history and geography concerned with each of the artists and each of the composers that you study. So you'll learn about where Monet lived or Diego Rivera lived or the other two artists and all four composers, where they lived, um, what the name of their country was, uh, what they looked like, things like that. And again, your child can either draw pictures of those things or you can print them off the internet and cut them out and paste them. It's totally up to you. I know some children just really don't like to draw in color, so why make them? The point is to retain the information, not to have a drawing lesson. So always feel free to adapt the curriculum to your child. Uh, so this is the history and geography notebook that goes with it. I'll just show you an example. So on week 11, it's the history of my family. Um, this says my, a movie my mom loved as a kid. So you would sit down the mom and the kid together and mom would tell their child about their favorite movie when they were little and then the child could either draw a picture or again you can just find a picture of the movie poster online and post and paste it there and then a song my mom loved as a kid so it's just giving you a chance to connect with your child and talk about the history of your family as a foundation for history in the elementary years and then this one says the history of my family my dad so this is my dad again you can draw a picture or paste one in his name is how he got his name. So the story of how he got his name. So that's what the history and geography curriculum looks like for your child's history. And then 
Let's see, some things that make my country special. Okay, so this is a page for one of the hero studies. One of my country's heroes. Their name is, was, what did this hero do that was important? And here is a picture of one great thing they did. So again, your family chooses which heroes you want to study. And you can spread those out throughout the year. You don't have to do them in the order we suggest in the parent guide. Um, so if it's relevant to a specific um, celebration day, for example, you can definitely do it during that time instead. Okay, so then we'll just look at Edward Hopper. He's one of the artists. So all the artists have a page like this where it, um, you put a picture of the artist here. It says where they were from. You can glue a picture or a map right here. And then your child's favorite painting that they made out of the nine paintings that you study. So that's what that looks like. And they have a similar page for composer study. So that is the history, geography, and um, fine arts curriculum for Blossom and Root that we'll be doing with my kindergartner. All right, let's wrap up with um, the music curriculum I've chosen for my daughter and then a couple of extras that we're gonna be adding in. So one of the things my youngest declared was that she wanted to learn guitar. We happened to get this awesome curriculum um, written by Corey Klaus. He sent us this curriculum to review over the years, so it just worked out perfectly. And um, I'm a little nervous because I don't know how to play guitar, so uh, we'll see. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping that this book will not only teach her, but will also teach me. But this is a really kid-friendly book. Um, it goes nice and slow. You start with the basics of the parts of the guitar, um, reading basic notes, you know, it's got all these coloring pages if your child likes to color. Mine doesn't really like to color, so she'll probably just like to learn and then move on. But it teaches you picking technique and the notes on the guitar and how to read music. I mean, it, it gets pretty in depth. I don't think we'll probably get through this whole curriculum in one year because it's really um, big <laughs> and it covers a lot. Like this actually gets to be pretty good advanced stuff toward the end which is awesome, because that means I don't have to go look for another resource. I think that if your child picked this up and did the whole thing, they would go from not knowing how to play guitar to knowing how to play a lot, um, all in this one book. So that's probably gonna last us a few years, but I'm really excited about it because it's something she really wants to learn. I really wanna learn too, so that's cool that I got a hold of this. Um, and I will definitely post reviews once we get into the program and get a feel for how it's working for Bryce. So I just need to find a guitar that's her size, that's not a ukulele. Every time I go to a music store, they try to sell me a ukulele, and I'm like, no, I need a six string guitar. <laughs> so still working on that. Another music curriculum we'll be doing this year with both my daughters is called um, Legends of the Staff of Music. And it's a fantastic Waldorf inspired program that is hosted online, but you can get printed out copies of it if you want to. And I haven't had a lot of time to really dig into it, but we're going to be doing the primer level, which is called Foundations of Music. So I'll post reviews once we get into the program, just like with the guitar curriculum, and let you guys know how we're liking it. But I suspect strongly that we are going to be very much in love with this program. And then the last piece for our music curriculum is uh, we're gonna do Squilt's Meet the Instruments series. She's got a bingo game and some memory cards and stuff, so I'm gonna order those and get them printed out. But we love Squilt. We've used them for a couple years now for different things. Last year we did the Baroque Eras curriculum. We didn't finish it, but we did a lot of it, and we really, really loved it. That's the last thing we'll be using for music. And then we have a few extras. We've got um, the Whole Family Rhythms. I went ahead and ordered the printed out guides because I really just wanted to have them. They can be used year after year after year. I know they're designed for children, I think under six, but even my oldest daughter loves all these activities and I suspect she will for some years to go still. So I just went ahead and ordered them. But it's just, uh, they've got like a weekly theme. Let me open it. So, okay, this was the week we just did. So this was Turtles and she always does like a finger game for the week or a poem for the week and then a story. And an inspired hike. We have so much nature study going on, we usually don't do the inspired hike. But um, she always includes like a recipe to go with it. And my youngest really loves to bake. So this week we did make the turtle shaped buns and they were so beautiful and delicious. And she really loved doing that. 
And she always has a prompt for wet on wet painting, which we love to do too. We don't do it every week, but hopefully with these guides, we'll remember to. And that's kind of why I ordered them is to help me um, keep a rhythm, especially for my youngest daughter uh, in this kindergarten year where we do certain things on certain days and she comes to look forward to them and expect them. And then she always has a little craft that you can do um, each week as well. And then the last thing is that she recommends the beeswax modeling, but they're just beautiful guides. It just helps me remember to keep a rhythm for our day. And you can do them year after year after year. Your children will look forward to them. They're just lovely activities. And then the other fantastic, beautiful resource that I want to use throughout the whole year um, are the Rooted Childhood monthly collections. So we did, I think, three months of these this year so far, and we absolutely loved every moment of it. These guides are just full of great activities to do with your children. We definitely don't do everything in them, but that's okay because we plan to do them year after year after year. And each year we'll do activities that we've already done and ones that we haven't. So I need to get these bound still. I wanna bind them all together. But um, she always includes like a little introduction and a theme for the month. This particular month we talked a lot about the moon and the lunar cycle. She also includes gorgeous stories. And I like her stories a lot. Um, my daughters really loved the Sea Baby's Blanket. And then she also has the Star Dollars from this January one. Um, she always includes poetry, which is wonderful, and recommended books to put in your book basket, um, and music and finger plays. So tons of stuff that you can use in your homeschool. Again, this is very um, Waldorf-y, so it suits our homeschooling style without feeling like we're um, limited by a lot of structure. And we love, love, love our Rooted Childhood Guides so much. Um, again, I'm, I'm going to take all of them and just get them bound into one big volume to keep on our shelf. This was the first year that she released each collection, so uh, once we have all of them, I'm going to bind them all together and keep it on the shelf. So between the Whole Family Rhythms, which is more of just like a, a steady hum of things that you do each week, and then these Rooted Childhood Guides, um, which are more uh, like really gorgeous projects that you can actually use in your home, um, and more recipes and more poetry. These are just fantastic, you guys. If you have not checked out Rooted Childhood, I highly recommend you do. Um, they will enhance and enrich any homeschool, no matter what your style of homeschooling is. And they're just absolutely gorgeous. And for me, I like pretty materials. So I am like a sucker for them. I order pretty materials that I do not need sometimes just because they're so pretty. But this is both pretty and functional. So I highly recommend those. So that is our homeschool year for kindergarten. I hope this was helpful for you guys. Um, please feel free to email me again if you have any questions. You can email me at christina at blossomandroot.com. And then if you want to check out samples of the Blossom and Root curriculum for kindergarten, you can find those on our website at www.blossomandroot.com. And then lastly, I will have a blog post on our blog, which I will link in the show notes below for you or in the video notes below for you. And you can go to that blog post to find links to all of the um, various things that we're going to be using, wild math, rooted childhood, um, Let's see, the, the guitar book that we're using, um, and then the book list for kindergarten. So if you want all of those links, just go ahead and click on that blog post link below and um, you can hop on over. So I hope you guys are looking forward to your year ahead. I would love to hear what you're using in the comments below, and I will talk to you guys later. Bye for now.